six years ago, I was sitting in the office in my clinic, which is down on the bottom right there, and I was looking at the performance metrics on HIV care in southern Alberta. And we look really good. I was looking at CD4 count, percentage at risk for catastrophic opportunistic infections, patients on treatment, and the most impressive was AIDS-related deaths. We've done really, really well. And I was thinking, what am I going to do with my career? You know, this is the disease is controlled. Should I join my colleagues treating hepatitis C? The next morning in the clinic, we had a little group session. And everyone was truly shocked because this was very unpleasant to someone we knew. And no one had an inkling that this lady who we'd asked about whether she'd had dreams on her drugs, whether she'd had diarrhea, whether she'd missed any doses, whether she was taking her pills with or without food, no one had sensed that there was an issue, a major issue at home. So this was an epiphany in my career, really, because I asked the social workers, well, is this common? And they gave me this reassuring feedback, oh, more common than you'd think, Dr. Gill. And the decision point was, do I say to them, well, I think you need to get working on it and try and sense more people if they've got this problem? Or do I apply my biomedical approach and say, well, maybe I better analyze it because anything that gives me numbers is good. I decided to go the analytical approach and I had a very keen undergraduate student working with me. And so we wandered upstairs to our sexual assault team and said, what survey should we use? And we have some pretty good standardized data and a standard survey. May not be the best in the world, but it's an intimate partner violence survey that's used in our region. Well, there is a literature out there, um, mainly anecdotal, that some environments are not very conducive to actually asking very personal histories from patients. And we were worried uh, that we might not be a great environment. In fact, we found the contrary. An HIV clinic is, is an extraordinarily safe place for people to disclose details they could, may not to be able to tell their parents, their children, their spouses. And we found almost universal, strong support from our patients that they felt it should, it's an integral part of HIV care, that they should be asked not just once at intake, but almost every year or even less um, every six months about whether they'd been exposed to IPV and whether this was limiting their ability to take their drugs properly. And we found that very reassuring um, and it should give others the confidence to actually ask about this delicate issue because it's a social determinant of HIV health. The People that I work with, and most recently it's been women, homeless women, there have been, um, there's a lot of connections actually. They're direct and they're indirect. And um, in we do both qualitative and quantitative analyses. Um, our research is mixed methods. Um, from some of the qualitative research, we saw early on that most of the issues that women were talking about, whether it was um, having, not having a place to sleep, accessing health care, um, a variety of things, the issue of violence came up. It came up in issues and in instances that we weren't even expecting. And so that was really profound for us, that it was just so prevalent. And, um, and we've also recently been doing some analyses where we've looked at looking at it the other way. So we're saying of people who, um, for instance, if you don't use stimulant drugs and then there's, you experience violence, people start using drugs after the violence. So we're seeing these sort of bi-directional associations where um, there are issues that are creating violence and violence are creating these other issues, particularly drug use. And um, it's, it's a, a complicated, interwoven situation. And we asked, the ladies in our study, what do you do when you don't have a place to sleep? The interviews were rich with information, but a few themes did come out. First, the ways that women negotiated housing mirrored the drug sex economy in that housing was available for sex and intimate partnerships were often violent. While women were oftentimes at lower risk for street homelessness than men, getting that housing required them to sacrifice their sexual safety. 
Many women talked to us about trying to extricate themselves from the Tenderloin neighborhood. That was where we did our, our work. They tried to basically hold up in their room and not go out if they could to intentionally isolate themselves. And finally, many women in our study did have government subsidies for health care as well as housing. And for a lot of women, this acted as a positive structural intervention. However, there was still a lot of violence, and that violence was mediating a lot of the potentially positive influences from these subsidies. So we knew that violence against homeless women was going to be an issue. We knew it was a problem. We just didn't expect it to come up in so many situations. On topics when we brought it up, when we were talking about other things, it came up all the time. It permeated every aspect of, of homeless women's lives. So in a future study, we dug into that a little bit more. We looked at different types of violence, and we looked at different perpetrators. We looked at primary intimate partners, as well as people who weren't, which in this case ended up being neighbors, strangers, ex-boyfriends, and family members. And as you can see, while intimate partner violence was a problem, it was only part of the problem. Um, it's particularly hard for people to you know, get out of their neighborhood because they're in a very, very low income neighborhood and the idea of having enough money to get out is completely beyond so many. And it's, it's a cycle that's really tough to get out of because they're in an environment that is violent and it's also cheap and it's hard to get out of. So it's hard to um, extricate oneself from that environment. And um, it's you know, time and time again, we see it quantitatively and also qualitatively. There's actually one story that I'm reminded of there is a, um, a person who was doing an interview qualitatively and she talked about the idea that she was able to get off the crack, she was able to get a place to live, and she got a job. And she was living in an SRO hotel, doing really well for months, doing fantastic. The problem was that it was still in the Tenderloin and the crack dealer still knew where she lived and the crack dealer knocked on her door five times a day and for a few months she was able to say no thank you, no thank you. and resist it and move on and it was that one bad day at her job and she comes home and there he is knocking on her door and so it she relapsed and it's just so hard to get out of that cycle when you can't afford to get away from that environment and so many of the ladies in our study just can't afford to get out of that. So in North America, particularly in Canada as well elsewhere in North America, single room occupancy hotels or small rooms within hotels that have limited, um, you know, essentially a bed and sometimes a plate um, for cooking, um, but are largely within the male dominant street culture given the overrepresentation of men. Um, and what this um, 70 women we spoke to within the qualitative work who lived in either these single room occupancy hotels or shelters or transitional housing shared were how examples of how these housing environments that are often run by males that um, have ex extreme risks for violence as well as other personal safety. So women talked about harassment and or violence from male managers, um, constantly having people knocking on their doors, so risks of physical and sexual violence or threats of violence um, that really impacted um, people's safety. Um, we also had a number of women who talked about how because of these um, dangerous conditions of many of the uh, single room occupancy hotels and transitional housing, women found themselves couch surfing as a means to not be in those environments um, and then described how that put them in risks of economic as well as sexual exploitation. So really talking about how needing to look at how these gendered environments of largely male dominant housing shape risks for violence um, for marginalized women. In the context of looking at HIV treatment interruptions for women who were sex workers living with HIV, um, what we saw was that incarceration um, as well as um, in a model looking at um, HIV treatment outcomes. Um, so, that looked, uh, so in the first case, we saw incarceration linked H um, HIV treatment interruptions. And in the second, when we looked at virological rebound, we see both violence and incarceration um, as predictors of poor HIV treatment outcomes. So not only is it impacting risks, which there is certainly growing epidemiological as well as social science literature, but it is playing out in terms of how violence is linked to HIV treatment access. Most gay and bisexual men um, can respond well to public health messages, use condoms, take PrEP, be adherent to PrEP, or um, talk to your partners about HIV, know your partner's HIV status, and know if they're on medication, know if their viral load is detectable. Most gay and bisexual men can use those kinds of public health information um, messages. Um, they can engage in complex sexual risk um, decision-making 
and they can keep themselves safe. And if they're HIV infected, they can keep their partners safe. Um, a small minority, somewhere maybe between 10 and 25% of gay and bisexual men can't do that. Um, things get in their way. And one of the things we know gets in people's way um, of doing that kind of complex decision making where they try to engage in self-care behavior is trauma. Um, traumatic experiences, particularly for people who have been traumatized sexually, put them in other sexual situations and they just start misfiring all over the place. They're avoiding things that they should really be attending to if they're in a sexual situation where they might be at risk, at risk for violence, at risk for HIV, at risk for other STIs. Um, An intimate partner violence is all often in that context. Um, so I think it's one of many psychological vulnerabilities um, that we need to address in order to help people who are at risk for HIV um, to protect themselves and for people who have HIV to do a better job of managing the disease for themselves. In 2004, so more than 10 years ago at Fenway Health, we implemented a tiny little one-page questionnaire on a grubby little sheet of paper that we gave to every patient that walked through the door over a period of about um, six and a half months. And we assessed just about everything you can think of with one question per, per area. And there was one badly worded question on intimate partner violence. And we've just recently been doing some longitudinal analysis based on people who reported intimate partner violence in that patient sample 10 years ago and looking longitudinally over the following seven or eight years what some of those relationships were. Um, a paper that's just come out in Journal of Urban Health, we report that sexual minority women who report intimate partner violence have increased medical care costs and increased medical care visits. Among sexual minority men with HIV, same thing is, um, I'm sorry, among uh, sexual minority men, intimate partner violence was associated with um, increased odds of being HIV infected and also with increased mental uh, medical care costs and medical care visits. And ironically for that population, um, this was not seen in increased mental health costs or mental he um, health populations. Um, so in terms of trying to put our heads together, both as a healthcare centre and also as somebody who's used to intervening on these individual level factors, we realize that first and foremost, we have to find some way of assessing the extent of the problem. Those of you who have interfaced with primary care know how difficult it is uh, to change physician or provider behavior with respect to anything that isn't one a billable activity or um, relevant to what they can intervene on and treat on, and that's really quite reasonable. And intimate, assessing intimate partner violence is, is one of those things. Um, one of the things we, um, having discussed for a couple of years and implemented last year, was how to systematically assess intimate partner violence in our primary care setting at Fenway Health. Um, and we came up with very simple, straightforward, um, four questions based on a lot of previous work done on the assessment of intimate partner violence and very consistent um, with the abuse assessment survey that some of you may be aware of. Well, I mean, the new term that's been introduced for about three, four years is syndemic. Intimate partner violence might be related to an abusive partner, but why doesn't someone leave their partner? Because the partner provides the housing. Um, there may be financial, there may be substance use. And so these, you cannot easily tackle one problem without being aware of, and perhaps even addressing several problems at the same time. This makes it complex, but the benefit can be huge because if you can correct one or two issues, you may return someone not back to physical health, but for social health. So in terms of a more positive note to end on in terms of what works, um, I wanted to share one example um, in the Vancouver context, um, which are what have largely developed over the last six to seven years by two um, operations, so Atira and Rain City, who operate um, housing programs um, that have developed these women-only supportive housing models. And so these are all women who are previously lived on the street or in transitional housing um, and use drugs and 
a large proportion have also engaged in sex work either formally or through survival means. Um, and the qualitative work um, that we did followed by some more epidemiological work really her narratives, repeated narratives from women about how being able to um, work in these or live in these women only housing programs um, with really supportive policies. So these supportive policies included um, sign in of people who coming in. So anyone um, who came in was signing in at the at, uh, with the managers, um, a lot of safety, so condoms, resources on site, um, and managers understanding and allowing um, guest, uh, support of guest policy, so allowing people to bring in, whether that's intimate partners or clients, to their rooms. Um, and this contrasts with, directly with um, what I shared before in terms of the gender risk environments where people were either being charged guest fees to bring in people to their own rooms um, or just not allowed to bring guests after certain hours. Um, and for women who were you know, supporting themselves through sex work and or have intimate partners, um, they were not able to bring those people into their own rooms. And so this contrasted with the women-only housing programs where women talked about being able to bring people in and where there was risk of violence having supportive managers who were then able to intervene in um, case for altercations. Um, women actually also spoke about po more positive relations with police. So police were aware of what was happening in the buildings um, and were coming into the building and taking out violent either clients or intimate partners. Um, so this was really a supportive model that's since been extended across a number of programs um, operated by Tier and Rain City in Vancouver. HIV is managed in primary care settings. So trying to, um, to conduct assessments, however brief, in primary care settings where folks with HIV are being treated um, is, probably, um, is probably quite important. We need to identify um, this minority of HIV patients who are experiencing this disruptive and potentially traumatizing um, violence. Um, by assessing it, we can um, refer people for treatment, and that's a challenge in and of itself. But, um, Establishing um, good treatments for violence, for violence recovery, and particularly for domestic violence um, in our chronic patient populations is probably also a priority. I think the evidence is growing that we have to think a bit, move beyond the biomedical model when we're treating anyone with an illness. We don't just think about this is the virus they have, these are the right drugs, this will help their cholesterol and that won't. You have to think in some, but maybe not everyone, about the social context of do they have a roof over their head? Do they have food on their table? Can they actually, um, have they got physical health to return to productive life? And you have to fix several things to make sure that people can attain um, maximal benefit from modern treatments.